All right, uh, before we talk about repentance and confession, um, I want to first share what I believe God's heart is. Because I, I, would you agree with this? If we don't understand our Father's heart, when we think about repentance and confession, we're gonna have a completely skewed view of that if we don't understand the Father's heart, yes? If you think God is a gray-haired, a gray-beard, austere, angry God, then when I start to talk about repentance and confession, you're gonna come at it from a completely different place than what um, I'm, I'm hoping you'll come at it from. And so I have a few scriptures that I wanna read to you. First John 1, 5 through 9. And this is in the English Standard Version, and it says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Now, real quick, I'm gonna just give you a little background on this. In the first four verses, John basically sets this up by saying, hey, I saw God, saw Jesus, I was with Jesus, I heard Jesus, I looked upon Jesus, and then he even says, I touched Jesus, okay? And so he is setting up, listen, I was with this man, and I saw what he did, and I heard what he said. I was able to touch him. And so I want you to understand that what I'm about to write, I want you to grab a hold of, because these are the things that I learned. And interestingly enough, John is the one that referred to himself in the gospel as the one Jesus loved. I love that. He totally understood what I'm trying to get you to understand, and that is this, God loves you. Don't live from a place where you're trying to earn God's love, or as DJ did so well in week two, it's not about from or for or underneath or above. It is God wants to be with you. And you have to get a hold of that before we even get into repentance and get into confession. He loves you. And then this is what he says. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another um, and the blood of Jesus, sorry, blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. Now, I was reading commentary on that and it's interesting because I've always heard that or thought of it from we have fellowship with one another. But actually in the context of this is what it's saying is if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we actually have fellowship with one another, God, God in us. If you wanna have relationship with Jesus, and again, the thing that really radically saved me was that comment, God doesn't want religion, he wants relationship. This is an incredible scripture right here when you think of it that way. Because God doesn't, um, God doesn't want you to, to be someone he can lord over and tell you, this is what you gotta do, this is what you gotta do. He wants to have a walking, talking relationship with you. And I think a lot of times we get so misaligned from that, but that's what God desires. And he sent his son to cleanse us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. So a couple things. One, God loves you, wants relationship with you. So when we talk about repentance and confession, please view it through that filter. God loves you and he wants relationship with you. Second, he wants you to understand that he forgives your sins and he wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not only does he want to, but he has. That'd been a good place for an amen. He has. He sent Jesus for all of us, for all of the world. He has sent Jesus to cleanse our sins. And it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But his heart, his heart is he wants you to understand that he sent Jesus so that you could live that life where you're like, I'm right before God. I feel cleansed. I I understand I'm not a perfect human being, but because of what Jesus did, I'm in right standing with my Father. Do you guys see that? Okay, through that filter. Second thing, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Another filter I want you to hear repentance from and hear confession from is this understanding that he made his light shine in each one of us so that we could have the knowledge of God's glory. He wants us to know him and he wants us to grow in that relationship. Okay, would you agree with that? Okay, 
The last one is Romans 2, 4. It says this, or do you disregard the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not really realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? And this section, this verse, is right in the middle of a section in Romans where it's talking about how people go about and do whatever that they want to do, and that God has had to actually give them over to this concept of that. And, and he says this, he sneaks this one verse in the middle of talking about that, and he says, or do you disregard the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? God's kindness leads you to repentance. His heart for each one of us is to have repentance. Now, here's the problem. I don't think we understand what repentance is. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna open up. I've got Braden on this side over here. Um, Darren is over here. And so here's what I wanna ask you. When you hear the word repent or when you hear the word of repentance, what comes to mind? Just lift your hand because we want to get you in the mic. Right here. Confessing your sins to God. <laughs> Refe- re- repentance and confession. Confessing your sins to God. Yep, that's good. That ties it together, right? I think you're going to find how these two actually work hand in hand. Very good. Very good. Somebody else. Turn around and go the other way. Turn around and go the other way. Okay. Somebody else. Yep. Oh, that, that was yours. Okay. Let me rephrase it. If we went downtown Castle Rock and asked somebody, what do you think repent or repentance means? What do you think somebody at downtown Castle Rock group of people, what do you think they're going to say about repent or repentance? Forgive. Forgive. A couple forgives. Okay. Stop. Stop doing the wrong thing. Stop doing the wrong thing. Okay. What else? Say I'm sorry. Say I'm sorry. Okay. Change. Change. Do you want to go more? Just. Change and go away from what you're doing. Make your life better. Okay. Good. Good. Or wait, let me get you the mic. If sin is being off the mark, it's the correction of the, of the movement. Hmm. If sin is being off the mark, we talk about the bullseye, it's the correction to get you closer or, or to hopefully to get bullseye like that, okay? What else? Over here, G? Humbleness. Humbleness. Humble yourself. Humble yourself, Okay. Good. Anybody else? It was interesting. I posted. Oh, wait, go over here. Yep. Wait, I'm going to have you do the mic real quick. When I think of repentance, I mainly think about God. I don't see repentance with another human being so much as I do with God. With God? Yes. Yeah, okay. More of a relationship with God and repenting for my sins with Him. Yeah, that's good. Whereas I'm Sorry, within the individual, but with God, it's repentance. Okay, that's good. That's good. I think all of these things, all these comments that you guys have mentioned um, are, are a part of repentance. But what's interesting is um, none of them actually hit what the Greek word actually means. And it just, uh, thank you for being open and, and thank you for sharing these things because I was very interested to hear the different responses. I posted a question, the same question, if you, when you hear the word repent, what comes to mind on my Facebook page? I, man, I think I had almost 100 people respond to that. And the answers were all over the board. And if it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, do you think it's important that we understand what that is? Because I think everybody in this room would agree with me that we have a loving God. I think we've taught that well. I think we've um, modeled that here in this church, and I, I see that, and I understand from hearing you guys that I think everybody in here really does believe we have a loving God. And that God is very kind. That kindness actually leads us to repentance, but we should know what repentance is. Okay, if you look it up, and again, 
I encourage you. Biblehub.com is what I use. I go online. I start reading through a verse, and when there's a word there, I'll click. You can actually click on the verse, and then you go up to Greek or Hebrew if you're on the Old Testament, and it actually starts to lay out what the word means. Now, why is that important? And I don't do it for every message, but when it's something like this, I think it's important to do this because I think a lot of times we take a word and put it in English, and it doesn't capture the true heart of what God wants us to understand, okay? Here's what repentance means. The word is, in Greek, metanoeo, metanoeo, and it means to change one's mind or purpose. It means to change my mind, to change the inner man, particularly with, with reference to the acceptance of the will of God. And then it says to repent. It comes from, and this is what got me so excited about this message right here. It comes from two different words, meta and, and um, <laughs> meta and noel. Okay, meta means this, to be with, after, or behind. With, after, or behind. Noeo means to think differently. So when you put the words together, here's what it means. When you're with someone and it changes how you think. So when it says God's kindness leads us to repentance, he's actually saying, God, my kindness leads you to be with me so you change your mind. Be with me, and as you're with me, you're going to change your perspective on life, on that issue. Okay, good? <laughs> Here's something really cool I found. In the Old Testament, and this is where some of the answers came from, in the Old Testament, repent is used over a thousand times. In one version I had, it was 1,084 times. And here's what it means. It means to turn around. And that's where a lot of people have heard teaching about repentance, to turn around, to walk away, to go a different way. The problem is, I would submit to you that you do that in your flesh and not in your spirit. And I don't know about you, but anytime I've tried to turn around from something, it seems like it heightens it in my life and I become worse than I was when I started. Anybody? The word repentance, I can't find in the Old Testament. I went through different translations. I found it one time in a King James Version, and it really doesn't have anything to do with what, kind of what we're talking about. Back me up. Look this up. Don't just take my word on it. Go and do your own study. But here's what I would submit to you, that when Jesus came and he died for your sin and my sin, he not only died so that we could have right relationship with God and have fellowship with him in relationship, and like we talked about in the first week of this series, so that we could have faith, I would also submit to you that he also died so we could have repentance. Interestingly enough, repentance is a noun. Repent is a verb, but repentance is a noun. It's a thing we receive. It's not a thing we do. And so here's how I will wrap all this up. When we get to a place where we are with God and he speaks to us, it changes our thinking and when we change our thinking, we are repentant in that area. It doesn't have to do with sorrow or saying I'm sorry or those things are fruit of it because if I'm with God and he shows me something that I've done to Kim, he's gonna say, hey, you need to make that right. Matter of fact, the word of God speaks quite boldly that if you have aught with a brother or sister, you need to go to that person. How do you guys do with that? I'm not really good on that. As a matter of fact, God is working that particular thing in my life right now, and it hurts. It's a deep work. And I'm starting to realize, oh man, I'm, I need to be so much better. But here's what's cool. I'm hanging out with God, and he's showing me that, and it's changing the way I'm thinking. And so, yeah, I'm gonna make things right with Kim, but that's just the fruit. It's the thing that comes from a changed mind. 
Okay? You guys good with that so far? Okay. So what does confession have to do <laughs> with this? Let me pass the mic around again real quick. Um, what, when I say the word confess, what comes to mind? Admit to what you're doing wrong, okay. Be true on what you're saying. Okay, I like that. Just know and acknowledge that you're doing wrong or have done wrong. Know and acknowledge that you've done wrong, you do wrong. Okay, that's good. Maybe going out on a limb here, but um, the, the verse that says, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that implies speaking. So I think there's a part of it that says you speak what you've done wrong. Yep. Speak with, okay, that's good. Anybody else? What do you think the world would say confesses? How, how, how much time you have? Meaning what? Oh, okay, okay, so, yeah, what does it mean to confess? And they'd be like, oh, how much time you have? Like, okay, yeah, okay, good. Again, a word that I think is difficult to maybe comprehend or understand, or we don't fully have that understanding, but I'm hoping that after tonight that you'll grab a hold and go, oh my gosh, okay, this is it. Hey, here's what confess means. It means to consent fully. It means to agree out and out. I agree I acknowledge, I consent. Here's what's interesting in the study that I had for this. There is only two times in the Bible where it tells us to confess our sin. And yet there's several other times that talks about confessing the greatness of God. It's one of those funky words that we've placed English and we've called it confess, but it means so many different things. Because when it comes to confess our sin, it means I agree with what God is telling me and I'm telling that out. But when it says confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and actually another meaning for confess is to praise. Is that interesting? And again, we've taken that Greek and we've put an English word in there and then we don't understand it. But I would submit to you this. There are a couple things that we need to confess. We need to confess from the praising heart. Janelle, oh my gosh. The, I was actually praying, God, is there anything you want me to communicate during the worship time? And Janelle just, she's like, I'm gonna, you know, and she just went at it. But the fact that singing, singing is a confession of God's goodness, yes? And I know in a room this size, some of you aren't crazy about praise and worship. It's not your style of music. You don't necessarily like it. You, find, you find yourself thinking, boy, we just keep singing the same words over and over and over. Why are we doing that? So you confess God's goodness. And here's what God was working on me during that time, during worship. He was showing me that when I'm right with him, I have no problem confessing through song. But when something's not right, when I'm living in my flesh, I have a hard time singing. For whoever has ears to hear, when we're doing praise and worship, where are you? Are you confessing that goodness? Are you having a hard time? And maybe that's an indication that God wants to get a hold of you and say, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? The other confess is that acknowledgement. And I'm gonna use a couple of the verses. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In James 5, 16, it says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Okay, so that is that acknowledgement. That's, okay, I've been with God. He shared something. It's changing my thought, and now I need to confess that and get it out. And there's great power in doing so because when you do that, um, it's amazing how the, the, the weight lifts off your shoulder and all of a sudden now you have somebody that can pray for you, hold you accountable, and help you to go through those things. Because I know that everybody's heart, at least I hope, I'm believing that everybody's heart in this room is that they wanna draw closer to God in here. In order to do that, 
We need to actually be with God, let him change our thinking, and then we need to go tell somebody what he's doing so that we have that accountability and that prayer support, okay? All right, I'm gonna tell a story. And um, I'm a little nervous about this, actually. Um, I'm gonna be very vulnerable to you, with you. Um, this happened f- almost 15 years ago in my life, and I'm gonna be sharing a very not so proud time in my life. But I think it has so much to do with this idea of repentance and confession. If repentance is really changing our mind, Think about the scriptures that come to mind. Romans says, don't be transformed by the power in this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 2 Corinthians, it actually says that we're supposed to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And I wish I could say that every time in my life, I've been able to do that. But I can't. And... 14 and a half years ago, um, it actually probably started 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more. I had been at Jubilee Fellowship for or five years. I moved back from South Carolina in 99, volunteered at the church for a few years, got to be part-time for a few years, and then went full-time after four years. This was another year later. And I found myself and my wife and I found ourselves in this place where we were serving and trying to do everything that we felt like the Lord was doing, but yet also serving Pastor John and what his, his vision was and what he was telling us to do. <clears throat> and we found ourselves getting into a place where we didn't agree with the things that he was saying and the things that he was doing. Not all of the things, just some of the things. Help me out here. Have you ever worked for somebody that you didn't agree with everything they were doing? (laughs) Okay, good. So I'm not alone. Thank you. That helps me. Here's the problem. I didn't understand what he was doing. And instead of actually addressing him like the scripture says, if you have ought with somebody, go to them. Instead of doing that, my wife and I actually started to talk about it well, I don't know if I would do it that way. And all of a sudden, our hearts started to get a little ugly. You guys okay with me telling you this? It went beyond that, though. We actually found another couple on the staff, and we started getting together with them. And lo and behold, we found out that they had some of the same grievances that we did. And so now, we would get together and have dinner together and start doing this and going on, going and going. Now, here's what's interesting. We didn't talk about the positive things that were going on. We only started to harbor on the negative things. Do you guys know? Have you ever been there? I wish I could say that's where it ended. It kept going. We kept meeting and we kept talking about these things. And I kept not listening to the Holy Spirit because I know the Holy Spirit was speaking. There were times where we'd, well, should we be doing this? Ah, no, it's okay. And we'd go right back into it. And we got to a place where we went on a staff retreat. And Pastor John was so incredible about these kind of things, man. He would just go all out on our, on our staff retreats. And, and you know what? It's funny. I never minded that, that aspect. Never talks bad about that. So we ended up going, there were seven couples on the staff at the time, and we ended up going to Lake Powell. I don't know if you've ever been to Lake Powell, but it's an incredibly beautiful place. We rented a houseboat, we, got a, we had a, a speedboat, and then we had a couple jet skis. And so it was just so much fun. But here's the thing that happens when you get with seven couples on a houseboat, is you can't really get away from one another. You just can't. And yet... Kim and I and this other couple actually found ourselves getting away from everybody else. We actually totally isolated ourselves from the other five couples. So much so that Pastor John told me later, he goes, man, I just, I I thought maybe you guys were just developing this really cool friendship and really cool thing. And so he was like, it bothered me, but I was excited for you guys. 
man, that guy's heart. Even in the middle of that, he was believing the best. Hmm. How are you doing in believing the best for people? So, here's what we do. We decided that we were going to get this houseboat, and, and the other couple that we were with, he's the one that actually had the connections for the houseboat. So he got it, and it was, we were going to go for three days, okay? And, uh, but he found out that he could get four days, and it would be cheaper than the three days for the houseboat. So he gets permission. He says, hey, can we get it for four days? And can uh, Dan and Kim and, and the two of us, can we actually stay that extra day? And Pastor John was like, absolutely. If it's cheaper, why not? without a doubt. So we go to Lake Powell and we have this plan together and it just started to reveal our heart. We started to pull ourselves away from other couples and, and we, we just couldn't wait for this extra day where everybody else left. Man, it was ugly. It was an ugly place to be. And I'll never forget, as we're ending up the time, one of the couples, the associate pastors at the time, one of the couples came up to me and said, hey, you know what? My wife and I has decided we want to stay with you guys. And this is ugly, but man, I was like, oh, really? Ugh. And it just, man, it just created this wedge. And I can't go into all the details, and nor do you need to know all the details, but ultimately what happened is I ended up confessing to this couple where our hearts were a little bit, a little bit. Have you ever confessed enough to get out of something? Anybody? So I confessed enough to get out of a situation but it wasn't enough to get me out of trouble. Because <laughs> see, Pastor John had left before that time came. And then when we came that, we actually had to bring it in front of the whole staff. And the staff was like, oh man, we totally understand. And they were so gracious to believe the best. They leave, Bob, oh, this couple actually stays with us. <laughs> and we treated them terribly. We get back, they tell Pastor John, okay, here's what went on. And Pastor John went, nope there is something wrong here in this situation. And so he pulls us into a staff meeting. He called an emergency staff meeting that weekend. So it was Monday through Thursday. That Sunday after church, he pulls the entire staff together and he addresses it. And he does it with love and fire. <laughs> That's all I can say. And we just sat there and we said what we had to say to kind of stay out of full trouble, but not complete honesty and openness, if, if that makes sense. I'm trying to be vague and is it coming across okay? All right. So Kim and I, we drove separately that day. We leave that meeting and we're like, oh my gosh. And where the meeting was left is, man, I don't even, I don't know where you guys are with your jobs right now, okay? And there was justifiable cause. I'm, tell, I'm not telling you the whole story. There's the, the ugliness, it was bad. And so there's even things that I'm not telling you, but I want you to know that it was the place where John was like, I'm praying about where your jobs are. And we leave. We drove separately. I'm, at the time we lived out in Roxborough, so it was about a 20 minute drive. And here's, what begins to happen? I'm driving home and God comes in and he begins to speak to me. He begins to be with me and he begins to start telling me, you gotta change how you think about this thing. Yeah, you've said enough to get out of trouble and you might keep your job, but you haven't even fully told the truth. And from that moment of hearing God say that to me, from being with him, my thought all of a sudden changed. Because all the way up until that time, it was self-preservation. I was saying enough to hopefully keep me from losing my job, from getting, and all of a sudden God said, hey, are you gonna do this right? And he began to speak into my heart and began to change my, in that 20 minute, my thinking on this. And by the time I got home, 
I found myself in a place that my wife was actually at probably days before. But I was telling, no, 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 we're not going to do that. No, 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 we're not going to do that. No, no, no. She had the Holy Spirit speaking to her way before I did. But here's what happened. I got to a place where I was like, Lord, I have to be right with you. And I don't care if I lose my job. I've got to be right with you. And I don't care what happens with my relationship with Pastor John and Chris or, or anybody else. I've got to be right with you. And he tells me, if that's what you want, you have to confess the whole truth. I got home. I told my wife. She went, good, I'm finally glad you're there. <laughs> and we called John. And John said, come on over. So I literally drove from the office all the way home, got back in my car, and drove to his house. Now, I called the other couple and said, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we feel like the Lord is telling us. We're going over there. Do you want to come? They were like, we don't have a choice. And they came. So we go and we confess the whole thing. We spew out the whole thing, where our hearts been, what we had been doing, how we'd been getting together, the things that we'd been saying. We just, bleh, I, just I mean, we just spewed it all out there. You know, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, <laughs> but he gives grace to the humble. <laughs> All right, everybody back here. <laughs> he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're crying. Pastor John and Chris are crying. And I'll never forget. He goes, you guys are fully restored. He goes, the fact that you did this, this is all I wanted. I just wanted to know where your heart was. I just really wanted God to show me. That's what my prayer was, that God would show me where your heart was so that we could make this right. And he goes, and he did it. And he goes, and not only that, but now that you've confessed that, he goes, I just want you to know all is forgiven and I will never bring this up again. And church, for 15 years, he never brought it up again. He totally let that go. He gave us such grace in that. I felt like God wanted me to tell you guys that, that story because I think it really exemplifies repentance and confession. The sorry and the coming out and telling John, that was just the fruit of my time with God and the change of mind that I had. And I think a lot of times, man, I've even had people tell me, you need to tell them to repent. That's never going to happen when another human being tells you to repent. How effective is that? Repent. You need to repent to your husband. He might say amen, but you're going to be like, beep no, right? Right? And yet, I think that's how we kind of have that, that, that understanding. Parents with your kids... You need to say you're sorry. What do you, you need to repent. You know what? You need to hear from God. You need to hear from God. What if we taught that instead of trying to adjust the behavior? What if we actually adjusted the heart and went after that? And so when it comes to see in 2020, the Bible says this, that we all see with a dim set of glasses on. And I believe our maturing process, the maturing process in our life is us actually getting to clean our glasses off. Oh, it's a little clearer. Oh, it's even a little clearer. And how do we do that? We get with God and we let him begin to change how we're thinking about something. And then we step out and no matter what it costs us, we communicate that as he leads us to do these things. And I believe that when you do that, what, can, what, what begins to happen is you begin to let that go and all of a sudden you get to see a little more clearer. I can't tell you, after we do that, after we did that with Pastor John and Chris, all of a sudden the world opened up to us. 
We all of a sudden, those things that bothered us didn't bother us as much. And if they did, we quickly dismissed them. We took those thoughts captive and we put them to the side. And here's the great news. I ended up working there for another 13 and a half years. Got to the place where he got with me and the other team members and said, hey, you guys need to go do this. Start Shine Church. And so as a team, we come down here. Why? Because God did great works in our hearts. Just so you know, none of the other team members were a part of that process. Just so you know. Don't want you to be thinking, ooh, was it uh, DJ and Cammy? Was it Robin? No, none of them. None of them were in this with us. But here's the good news. No matter how bad we make a mistake, no matter how bad we blow it, if we allow God to come in and spend a little bit of time with us, he'll begin to change the way that we think about things. That's repentance. That is the gift God wants to give to you and I. He wants to give us the gift of thinking differently. It does take some action on our part because it does say repent several times in the New Testament. But that repent is about changing your mind. So here's how I will conclude. Will you go before God and ask him to change the areas in your life where maybe you're thinking about things wrong? Will you go to him and say, God, renew me, transform me by renewing my mind? Will you help me take every thought captive and make it subject and obedient to you? And will you be willing then to listen to him and then respond in whatever way he asks you to do that? There might be pastors from your past that you need to call and ask for forgiveness. And I judged you. I had a bad heart towards you. There may be relationships with other people that God pinpoints and, and you need to call them and you need to say, you know what? Man, God has changed my thinking on this. He got with me and I need to make this right with you. You, need to, you may need to get with the people that maybe you've been hanging out with and maybe there's been some negative talk and you need to get with those people and say, you know what? We have to stop this that God is showing me we have to stop this and we actually have to bring life into this relationship. Man, we should be speaking life-giving things, not these death things. But here's the thing. God needs to come and be with you to show you those things, yeah? So I wrote in my notes this. Here's my concluding heart for the message in the series. We pray that you will ask God to shine his light onto your heart understanding that we all have some darkness that needs to be exposed. Would you guys agree with that? We all have dark areas in our life. One of the reasons that we called this church shine is because, man, when God shines, there's no room for darkness. But there's different areas. I might be fully lit up in this area and hiding something in this area of my life. And what I'm saying is, will you ask God to come in and light those areas up as he wants to do? Understanding we all have some darkness that needs to be exposed. We pray that you will ask him what mindsets you have that need to be changed and that you would confess them to those he asks you to. As we all do this, I believe we will see with a cleaner lens and reflect him more today than we did yesterday and more tomorrow than we did today if we will just be with him and let him change our mindsets and then step out and confess those things to other people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. God, I thank you the fact that you want us to be able to see more clear. God, that you want us to mature into that relationship with you so that we can have the heavy burdens kind of lift off our shoulders and actually respond more and more to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to every single person in here and help them to understand that um, <laughs> even in the ugliest of situations, you are still so kind and that kindness is what leads us to repentance. And so God, I pray that you would give us your voice and your heart and you begin to reveal things to us. And God, I pray that we would respond with godly sorrow and not worldly sorrow. Because that godly sorrow comes from a place where we say, God, I don't care what happens. I have to make this right with you and I. And when that happens, God, it's just so amazing that take, what takes place. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work this in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for that in your name.
Amen.